Well, good morning. There we go. Hey, there we go. Right. I'm not sure I was fully on there. there we go. Well, good morning. Welcome to everybody who's joining us on site and those who are online with us this week as well. Uh, if you're with us last week, you know that we're continuing through our study on the book of James. And last week, we started addressing this contrast between words and actions. And James suggested to us that a saving faith will always lead to, will always be revealed through good works. And if you missed that, you can watch that on demand online through our websites at westmeadows.org, or hopefully you were with us. And, um, and you remember that that was, that was the teaching we focused upon. And he was emphasizing that there's this need for our actions to prove the genuineness of our faith. Well, so that was, that was last week. Last week we talked about that, but this week we're going to continue that theme as we continue walking through the book of James. This idea that faith and works go together. But today we're going to focus upon the important role that words play in that scenario. Now what do we know is true? We know that our words are powerful. True? Words are powerful. They have the power to build up and they have the power to tear down and to destroy. True? We probably all experienced this. I imagine all of us can remember the first time somebody important to us, maybe a parent or, a, or, or our, our first crush or maybe our, our, our first serious romance in high school, the first time somebody said to us the words, I love you. Can you think of the first time somebody said that word to you, that I love you, and it resonated with you, and, and it, didn't just, it didn't just hit your ears, it impacted your whole self. Maybe if you think about that moment, you remember a time that a smile came to your face and you could feel your, your cheeks blushing a little bit and, and your heart filled with joy. And, it, and whatever you were doing in that moment, you felt like you had more energy to do it. These words are powerful. They build up. They can energize. They can impact the whole self. Well, you probably also recall maybe the, the other side of that coin, right? Maybe somebody who, who shared words that put you down. Maybe somebody who expressed a dislike or a disdain for you or, or told you you were doing a poor job, told you they were disappointed in you. Maybe words that were threatening to you. Again, it affects the whole self. You can feel crushed, the weight of that moment, the weight of those words. You can, you can feel like you're devalued. And some of you maybe can think of a time in the past where that happened and you're still carrying the wound of those words with you in this very moment. Words are powerful, true. But words also have another power. They have the power to build up. They have the power to tear down. But you know what else they have the power to do? They have the power to reveal. They have the power to reveal our hearts. And these are things that James is going to get into today. Now, here's what I mean by they have the power to reveal our hearts. Consider, for example, we can take one word, one, 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 one single, seeming, innocuous word, and based upon the speaker of that word, we give life to it. We give power to one word based upon the intention of the speaker. Consider, for example, the word fire. If you are in a room that suddenly catches on fire and you care for all the people, you might yell, fire! Because you, you want them to get to safety. You care about the people in the room. Consider also in a, in, a, in a military conflict, if you have an enemy that you want to defeat, you might still yell the word, fire, to attack. And then this past week, I came across another example that sometimes young adults use this word in a different way. You encountered that? I'll give you an example. Zach came to my office this week. He was, he was listening to some new worship music and trying to think of what he might be able to select to fit into our Sunday morning worship services. And, and he came in really excited. He came in super excited. Let's see if I can remember what he, what were the words he said? He said, he said? he said, Mark, have you bumped this new beat yet? It's fire. I'm totes about it, no cap. Now, I, I was confused for a moment. I thought, are you having a stroke? Or, like, <laughs> what's taking place? Now, but, but then I understood. I had to think about it for a second. And, and here's the translation for those of you who may not understand. He was saying, Reverend Dixon, I, I was listening to some new music this week, and I cannot lie, I found one that I really like. Uh, but, but he used a different word. He completely used different words that has the power to, to make us laugh, the, the power to confuse, and the power to probably embarrass him backstage right now as, as he did that. So, but we can see that how powerful words are, right? And this is what we look at in James chapter 3. If you want to follow along, you can do so in your pew Bibles. Page 978, or scan that code in front of you. Take you right to the pew portal. That's where our sermon notes are. And here's what we see. We see in James chapter 3 
that he challenges all followers of Jesus Christ to consider their words, to consider the power of their words. Because we need to be aware how powerful these are. They have the power to impact other people, but they also have the power to reveal a lot to the world about us and about our God. And because of how powerful these are, he actually begins with a warning. He begins with a warning in James chapter 3, verse 1. A warning against anyone who would want to sort of garner influence through the use of their words. And here's what he says. He says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow brothers. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, this word teachers, we can understand this as as sort of anybody who is teaching the things concerning God. Things about faith, about salvation, about conduct within within the church and with the life that relate to God. Anything that's, anyone who's teaching things about God. And this would obviously refer to pastors and and, and preachers. But I think it also extends to uh, our life group leaders, our Sunday school teachers, somebody who's maybe a spiritual mentor in your life. And I think it goes even further than that. I think our parents, parents and grandparents, we can find ourselves in this verse as well. Because anyone who is in a role where they are using words to shape and to guide and to educate people in the things of God. And when we consider the subject matter of what these words are talking about, if you consider the potential implications of speaking and teaching the things of God, you can see why James takes it so seriously. Because each word we speak has great influence over a life, over a person's eternity, and how we lead them towards that. And, and also has great influence over ours as well. Because he says that God is going to grade you tougher than he's going to grade your students. I've always taken this seriously as a pastor. I, I've always strived to take the, the effort and the prayer and the time it takes to properly use words and the word of God in particular. In part because I understand from verses like this the significance of the responsibility to be a teacher. But also in part because when I was younger, in my early years before I was a pastor... When I was just a young adult growing in my own life, in my own faith, I was asked to teach an adult class. And the class I was asked to teach that in some ways I foolishly agreed to teach was a class that was on the topic of why do bad things happen to good people? And I was this young adult put into this position to teach on this topic. In this room in front of me were adults who were going through divorce cancer diagnosis, bankruptcy, miscarriages. People asking these genuine questions of God and faith and conduct. And looking back, I know I was sincere. And I know I tried my very best to teach well and appropriately. But when I look back at what I taught from what I know now, I kind of wonder, did I do more harm than good? And 30 years later, it still bothers me. That, that I may have done harm in the lives of those people or to their relationship with God from what I taught 30 years ago in that class. Now, before you decide to quit volunteering for Sunday school, or, or before you decide to, to decide, I'm going to let the church teach my kids, that it's too risky otherwise, let, let's see what James says in verse 2, because it's important to look at verse 2. He says, we all stumble. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. And able to keep their whole bodies in check. Now, James says we all stumble. And he's including himself in this we. This is, this is a broad we. He's like, I'm, I'm including this one, guys. We all stumble. He includes himself. And I hope that takes a bit of the pressure off if you find yourself in a teaching role. James is saying, hey, look, there, there is grace. There's grace. James wants us to understand the power of our words that we share when we teach. He wants us to take it very seriously. He wants us to handle words with care. We want to know what's at stake when we're teaching. But we're all works in progress. We all will stumble on words occasionally. And there's grace in those moments. You know, I, I feel bad about some of the things I may have taught 30 years ago, but, but I know God honors the genuineness of my heart in that moment, that I, I honestly, genuinely tried my best, and I, and I put forth my best effort in that situation. 
And, and, and I don't believe that he's eternally condemned me for, for that teaching. I, I trust that, that God brought other people along after the fact to maybe correct the things that I had misspoken unintentionally. I, I believe that, that God probably brought people along to, to mentor and to example the things that I was not yet mature enough to be able to do in that situation, in that classroom for those people. And, I, and I'm also trusting that he led the church leaders to have more wisdom on who they chose to, to put into situations like that. And I am also confident that God's kingdom still stands, that that one bad class that I taught did not tear down all of God's work throughout eternity. So well, there is grace that exists. But here's our role. Our role, not just for teachers, but for all who are followers of Jesus Christ. Our role is to work to control our words. And he makes a big claim. If you look at verse 2, he makes a big claim. He says, if we're able to control our words, it will impact every aspect of ourselves. He says, we will have self-control in our lives. We will have improved relationships with others and with God and with ourselves. We'll be able to keep our whole bodies in check. Now, obviously, that, that, that's not possible this side of eternity. But what James is doing is he's painting this picture. He's making a big truth claim about a goal that we should all be striving towards. Why? Because this is part of what we refer to as sanctification. This idea that we're gradually, ever more increasingly being shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. And that sanctification, that ever gradually increasing aspect is revealed through our works, which we talked about last week, and will also be revealed through our words, which we're talking about this week. So have you ever, have you ever thought about this stuff before? Like, have you ever thought about how much control your mouth has over so many aspects of your lives. You ever thought about that? Because James says, our mouths control everything. And he goes on to further illustrate this. He gives some, like, some real world examples in verse 3 and 4 where he talks about, uh, first he talks about horses who are like these big, beautiful, powerful animals. But then you take a bit, this, this small piece of metal with some leather straps on it, and you, you put it in their mouth and suddenly the rider is able to control the entire animal. The rider can control the direction, the speed, if they jump, if they stop. Small little bit. Incredible horse. He talks about ships, these large sailing ships that were loaded with cargo, would weigh thousands and thousands of pounds, are, are powered by the wind. They, they put a sail up and the wind hits it and, and no one can control the wind. We can't control the wind, but when this sail goes up and this wind moves the boat, there's this rudder, a rudder which, which typically is 1% the size of the sail. is kind of the scale they use. 1% the size of this scale and this rudder, this 1% the size of the scale, it moves the whole ship. And he says, so it is with our tongues. The tongue has the power to steer the whole life. And the reason James is so, so interested in teaching in detail about this is because he knows the destructive power that our tongues have. Here's what he says in verse 5 about that. He says, likewise, the tongue is the small part of the body, but it makes these great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Every summer we're familiar with that, aren't we? The danger of one spark. One campfire ember not put out. One, one misplaced cigarette butt. And this small little spark, this small little flame sets an entire forest ablaze. We, we live this every, every summer. Scorching tens of thousands of hectares of land and trees. Causing destruction and danger for people and property and communities being evacuated from such a small little spark. And he says the tongue... When the tongue speaks words, like that tiny little spark, a tiny little spark that can do incredible destruction. One, one careless sentence can destroy a relationship. One, one, one lie can destroy a reputation. One accusation can steal a future. One insult can destroy a self-worth or lead a person into depression. You know, when Nadine and I do, do marriage preparation, we meet with couples, and one of the things that we challenge them to do is to erase certain words from their vocabulary. To tell them there are certain words that you should never speak into existence. 
And one of those words we tell couples to erase from their vocabulary is the word divorce. And here's the reason why. If you find yourself in an argument, things get heated, things get emotional, and you're trying to hurt the other person, let's pretend we don't do that. That's, that's what an argument is. You said something to me that hurt, I'm going to say something to you that hurts. If that goes back and forth in your relationship, all of a sudden this careless word can get thrown out. All of a sudden these careless words get thrown out. And we're thinking, well, even if we didn't even mean it, we say, well, maybe we should just get a divorce. It feels like we're headed towards a divorce. It feels like we're already living as though we're divorced. You see, the minute it's spoken, it's given life. It's given a potential reality. As soon as it's spoken, it's a spark. That could potentially turn into something. But if it is never spoken, it can never be given life. Just one little word, misspoken, misshared. And one little spark can lead to tear down so much. And James continues in verse 6 to talk about this. He says, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Not only... Does it set fire? It says, James says here, it, it, it is itself on fire. And the source of that fire, the source of the fire of our tongues, he says, is hell. As though Satan himself was trying to get us to say things that would potentially destroy, that would potentially damage God's people and God's ministry. Does that sound like something he may have done a few times in Scripture? Using words to just set a spark? That might turn into something that would derail God's will and God's plan. We see this throughout Scripture. Back in the Garden of Eden, Satan uses God's words to tempt Eve. Did God really say? When Jesus begins his ministry in the desert, he twists God's words to, to tempt him, to try to derail Jesus, to say, there's another way. You don't have to go to the cross. There's another way you can be king of all this. And then we see another example of this when, when, when Jesus, in Matthew 16, when Jesus starts talking to his disciples about the fact that he does have to go to the cross. And we read this in Matthew 16, in verse, starting in verse 21. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, he, he's telling them, I must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must then be killed, but on the third day that he would rise again. He explains these things. He's sharing these things with his disciples. And then what happens? Peter comes to him. Peter comes to him, takes Jesus aside, and she says, no, never. Never, Jesus. Never, Lord. This shall never take place. What was Jesus' response in verse 23? Get behind me, Satan, he says. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, whether Jesus here is calling like Peter Satan directly, or if he's or if he's speaking directly to Satan for his influence over the words that Peter has shared, either way, Peter's words are in opposition. They're they're meant to deter Jesus from fulfilling God's word. And Jesus' response to Peter is these words you're saying, you're not thinking, you're not you're not saying things that are of God. You're saying things that are of your own self, of your own selfish motives. That's that's where they're coming from. James, it's kind of a direct teaching, isn't it? James James gets in your business. Like like everyone likes the book of James, but James gets in your business. Every every chapter, every week, get ready for that. It's such a direct teaching because I know know a lot of this resonates with many, many people. Because we have this tendency to speak, probably speak too quickly. I think we could say. Where sometimes we might feel like we have these thoughts in our minds. And we feel like this archer who's like pulling back a bow as we think about these words. And then we speak them and it's like we release the bow. And the arrow shoots through the sky. And a few seconds later we're like, oh, oh, wouldn't mind taking that back. But you can't. It's gone. You can't grab the arrow once it's released. All you can do is sit back and watch it fly through the air. Until it hits. 
and does its damage. Sometimes we speak too quickly and we're too slow to listen. That's the opposite of what James says, isn't it? Back in James chapter 1, verse 19, what did he say? He said, everyone should be quick to what? To listen. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to, slow to speak. Everyone should be quick to listen, to pull that bow back and go, what might happen if I release this? <laughs> is that really what I want? We know this is true, don't we? And we know that so many people want to grow in this area of their lives. As, as James said earlier, if we can learn to control the tongue, if we, can, if we can learn to control the words that we speak, there's so many other parts of our lives, so many other parts of ourselves that will be positively impacted if we can learn to control the tongue. And it's part of this cooperation we need to have, this cooperation with God's work in our lives, God's work of sanctification in our lives. We have to cooperate with what God wants to do to shape, to mold, to teach us to receive those lessons, to obey them, to surrender to them, that we can learn to grow in him. And we'll find ourselves gaining better control of our words. But is it also true that that falls under the category of, well, Easier said than done, Pastor Mark. <laughs> it's, it's great to stand up there and say that, but man, easier said than done. And, and absolutely, but James acknowledges that. He, he says this in verse 7. There's all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no one, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. No human being can tame the tongue. God told us in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, that we are to go and to subdue and to rule over all creation. And we've done a pretty good job of that. We've done a good job of, you know, those steward resources to use them for our needs. We've, we've, we've done a pretty good job of tending and caring and using and, and domesticating animals. You, know, you, you go to the, you see, you go to the circus, you see these elephants and tigers that are, that are being tamed. Our, our dog Jasper He's, we've got him to the point where we, we do hand signals and he sits and lays down for, from hand signals. We have tamed all of creation. But the tongue is elusive. The tongue seems to be beyond our control. And if this is something that you want or you know that you need to have growth in, if this is something that you know you need to address in your life, there's an opportunity for you. To grow in your relationship with others and with God and with yourself. And if it's really something that, that you know you need to work on, then I want you to pay attention to this final section. Because this is where now James, he's, he's addressed the, the problem. Now he's going to move towards addressing the solution. And he's going to talk about some really important things that helps us understand how the tongue can be tamed. And he does so, first of all, by describing the contrary ways in which people tend to use their tongues. Starting in verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the mouth, out of the same mouth comes praises and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. The way that he describes this, with one tongue, where it praises in one moment and curses in the other, it's hard to argue with him that that's, that that's wrong. Agreed? It's hard to argue against that. It's It's true. Where one moment we can be in church on Sunday morning singing songs like, like, great are you, Lord. Like we sang this morning, you you are the breath in our lungs. We pour out praise through our hearts and through our mouths. We pour out praise to you. And then we're going to leave here in a few minutes and it's going to get tested. It's going to get tested by bad drivers. It's going to get tested by tired kids. It's going to get tested by slow servers in the restaurant. It's, it's going to get tested by family tensions. We, we're, we're here praising, great are you, Lord. Every breath that comes out is a praise to you. And then we're going to leave, and there's going to be that driver. right? We know this is going to happen. It's going to be tested. And it's, it's, it's common, right? And I don't want to single anybody out in particular, but a few years ago I came across this mugshot, which I thought was perfect for an example of this, where there's this lady here. Obviously, she's been arrested. And you can't fully see it, but she's wearing a shirt that says, stop the violence. Earlier this day, she was at a rally to take a stand against domestic violence. To say it is wrong, it needs to stop, it needs to end with us. She's at this rally, cheering these things. Guess what she got arrested for? 
Yeah, she went home, got into an argument with her husband, pulled out a 45 caliber handgun, and fired a bunch of rounds off into the mattress. <laughs> and then later on, still wearing the shirt, she, she gets her mugshot taken. James says these things must not be. We cannot have one tongue that blesses our creator and then a moment later it curses those created in his image. We have to be very careful about this because these things should not be. So what's the solution? Well, it's not as easy as just watch the words that you use. Sometimes that's where we start. Well, I'll just do a better job of watching the words that he uses. It's, it's not that easy. There's a deeper issue. And this is what he gets to here, this deeper issue in verse 11. He says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or can a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, it might be a little bit cryptic, like how does that, how does that give us a solution? Well, here's what he's talking about. He's giving examples to us here that are impossible. You can't get fresh water and salt water from a single source. You can't have figs from an olive tree or olives from a fig tree. You can't have figs from a grapevine. Why? Why can't you have those situations happen? Because it's not in the nature of each of those sources to produce those things. If you have a fig tree that produces olives, what is it? It's an olive tree. <laughs> it's an olive tree. It's in its nature to be an olive tree. What comes out of something reveals its true nature. Here's his main point. If what comes out of us is negative words, slanderous words, cursing, hurtful words. If that's what comes out of us, I'm sorry to get in your business a bit, but if that's the case, we have to look at the nature of who we are. We have to ask ourselves the question, have I really surrendered my heart to God? Have I really allowed his transforming work to take place in me? Now, the measurement is not perfection. We talked about that in verse 2. The measurement is not perfection. The striving, the goal, the continual sanctifying work is towards perfection. But if we know that the fruit of our words leans towards so often these negative things, we have to ask ourselves, have I really surrendered my heart to the transforming work of Jesus Christ? Have I really experienced new life in Christ? And if so, then the next question we have to ask ourselves is, am I really allowing the Holy Spirit to do that ongoing transforming work? Because when we accept Christ, in that moment, we are given a new life. We are given a new purpose, a new identity, a new nature, a new heart, new passions, new desires. The things of the old start to bother us and offend us, and we want to move away from them. That happens, but it's a gradual progression that we allow the Holy Spirit to do his transforming work in us. And Jesus himself spoke of this. He spoke of this when he talked about how the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What, whatever we have stored up in our hearts, that's what the mouth will speak. So the solution is not found in just trying harder to watch your words. It's good to do, but if that's all we're doing, if we're just going to rely upon ourselves, our own efforts. That's why James says, no human being can tame the heart. That doesn't mean it can't be tamed. Verse 2, he said it can be tamed. But no human being can tame the heart. We need to do our part, but part of our role is to allow Jesus to do his part. To change the heart. To change the heart. The solution is not found in just trying harder on our own to do good. Because if that's all we're going to do, don't be surprised if maybe you stop speaking hurtful words. But all that ends up happening is the outside words just become inside words. Because it didn't change the heart. And it's not so much watching your words, it becomes more a case of watching who hears your words. If we do it on our own. Because there's no heart change. We cannot do it on our own. We need help. And that's something that God has promised is available to us. Jesus Christ gave his life to pay the price for the sin of our old nature, that we may have new life in him, that new hope and that new destiny, that new passions, new giftings, new attitudes, that we may have that, the new heart, the new nature. He promised that that is available to all who will come to him. 
But even after we do that, we will still wrestle with the old nature, which is why we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work to gradually shape us into the image of Christ. And so as I close, I just want to share with you one way that I've always found very helpful, a story that I always found very helpful to, to describe exactly what I'm talking about here. And it's the story of a farmer who had a crab apple tree. And as you know, crab apples produce a rather sour kind of fruit, don't they? Many people don't like crab apples. This farmer didn't like it either. He didn't like crab apples. He didn't like crab apple jelly. He didn't like the taste of it. But he did like his tree. He loved his tree. He intentionally planted the tree. He cared for the tree. He, he wanted the tree to be part of his garden. But the problem was it only produced sour fruit. And the fruit was worthy of being thrown away and not much else as far as he was concerned. And so he needed to do something or it would never change. So he had this idea. His idea was this. He went out one day and he cut it diagonally across the trunk of that tree and, and went to another tree and cut an identical fresh section on an di- identical diagonal angle, brought the two together, and he spliced them. And he wrapped it and sealed it and braced it. And then before he left the tree, he went and he snipped off the old tag that said crab apple, and he attached a new tag that said golden delicious apple. Now, for the next few months, not much happened, but suddenly buds started to appear above the splice line. And those buds turned to blossoms, and the blossoms eventually turned to apples, but, but they weren't crab apples. They were golden, delicious apples because it had a new identity. See, the tree still had some issues, though. Even though it was producing these golden, delicious apples, it still, it still had some issues because below the graft line, below where that splice had been made, shoots would still try to appear. And if he didn't come out there and tend to those shoots, if he didn't come out and cut those shoots off, they would grow stronger. There would grow more of them. And eventually they would blossom. And if they blossom, they would grow apples. But below that splice line, they would grow crab apples. And if those were allowed to continue, they would dominate the entire tree. If they were allowed, the tree would grow wild and grow sour fruit. But even if it did that, You know what the farmer never did? He never snipped that tag off the tree. Because it was truly a golden, delicious tree from that day forward. He would never change the tag. It was still a golden, delicious tree. It just wasn't a very healthy one. It wasn't a very healthy one. You see, from our hearts will spring forth acts and words that reveal our true nature. And if out of our mouths come both blessings and curses out of the same mouth, something's wrong. Something needs to be addressed. And maybe what needs to be addressed is that you aren't that new creation. You haven't allowed the farmer to come and to deal with the old nature. Maybe, maybe, maybe you need to allow the gardener to come and to do that work in your life. To give you a new heart. To, to allow fruit to flow from you that is true to a new nature that he longs to give you. Or maybe you, maybe you are a new creation. Maybe you have that tag hanging on your life that says child of God. But you've allowed the old nature, that old identity, you've allowed those shoots to go unaddressed for far too long. Your identity hasn't changed, but it's being dominated by the old self. And if so, the Holy Spirit is doing a work in your life and he's wanting you to follow him, to surrender to him, to obey him, to allow him to clean that up in order that we may speak words that would build up, that we may speak words to the world and to the church and to ourselves that would restore and bring healing, that we may speak the name of Jesus Christ and live out in word and in deed his grace, truth, and love that is for all people. To reveal to the word the grace of Jesus, where our sins that separate us from God, there is forgiveness. The truth of Christ, that if we will believe and trust in him in this world where there are so many options, and which one do we choose? We choose the solid ground to walk, the solid ground of Jesus Christ's truth. And that leads us to life, that he gave his life for us, that we may experience grace and truth and experience that new nature, that new life in him. Amen? All of that is made possible by the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to celebrate as we come to the communion table. On the communion table, we know that we have the bread, which is symbolic of his body, in which he was born, in which he lived, in which he spoke, 
and taught and modeled and ministered, but ultimately sacrificed in our place. We know also that as we come to the communion table, there is the cup that is symbolic of his blood that was poured out as he gave his life that we may have life. And in that moment, in the moment of his sacrifice for us, the sin that separated us, that caused a separation between us and God, was dealt with. In that moment, sin was dealt with. And the free gift of salvation, the farmer's work had begun. The free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of new life was offered to all people. But we must choose to receive, like any gift, we must choose to receive it. And so as we come to this communion table, reflecting upon these words from James, I I want you to know and reflect upon this that there is a gift for each of us at this table. For many of us, it will be a place where we come together to remember the words of Jesus Christ, the, the, the sacrifice and the action of Jesus Christ, and we'll come to this table to remember and to worship him for his loving sacrifice for us. But I know there are others who have an opportunity to come to this table to surrender their lives. To say, I have not found that new source, that new nature, that new heart that Jesus promised. And we can speak the words of commitment today and say, thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sins, the price that I could not pay on my own. Not only can I not tame my tongue, I can't tame my heart on my own. But thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life for me. I now give you mine. And we can then call him and speak the name Savior because of what he did represented by this table. I know there are others here as well who have made that profession of faith in the background, but maybe, as I've been speaking today, you you know you've allowed the old nature to grow. Whether it's through your words or your actions or whatever way that's revealed in your life, you know you've allowed the old nature to grow wild. And there's an offering, there's a gift for you of reaffirmation here where you can come forward and say the words, forgive me, forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me new again, that I may call you Lord. And all who personally know Jesus Christ are invited to share in these elements. And if you didn't receive them on the way in, you can put your hand up and an usher will bring them to you now. I just want to leave you for a moment to examine our hearts as Paul commanded us to do and reflect upon these words. And then we will take these elements together in a moment.